Okay, so fun fungi. I mean, is there a reason why um, you know I like to party because I want to be a fun guy, right? <laughs> um, all right, so fungi. Uh, basically, with this, there's two types. There's molds and there is also yeast. Uh, molds kind of grow in long branching, what's called hyphae, uh, and they kind of they grow in cooler temperatures of the skin. So you'll see those more or less like on the outside of your skin over here that's exposed to the air, whereas Yeast itself is going to be more, uh, they have spores, and they grow where there's going to be a lot warmer temperatures. So we usually see this in the mouth, in the vagina, under the breast. We see those areas where it's going to be uh, very warm areas, okay? Um, so that's what you need to know about those things. Now, basically what's happening is that the fungi uh, that, that causes diseases, we call these types of, it is a group of uh, fungi that do this. We just call them in a nice group dermatophytes, all right, um, or tomatophytes. Basically, um, they cause something, a disease called tinea. Now, tinea, laymen call it ringworm, but it's anything but a ringworm. There's no worm about it, I think, just because there's shape of an O or a ring, but it's a misnomer. It is not a, it's not a flatworm, it's not a tapeworm. It has nothing to do with a parasitic worm. It's not a, a parasite, for that matter. Um, so just be careful of that when uh, patients say that. Um, but it's not a, a worm at all. Now, tinea has uh, different names to it, depending on where it's located. For instance, tinea corporis is actually anywhere on the body, namely the trunk. Okay? Um, tinea capitis would be found on the scalp. Tinea curis is in the groin, and laymen call it jock itch. In fact, the spray for jock itch is called Prurex. If you go to Walmart or CVS, that's what it's called for that reason. Then we also have tinea pedis, uh, which is, occurs on the foot, and that's the old uh, athlete's foot. All right? But they're basically all treated the same way on here. And unfortunately, tinea takes an awful long, long time to treat. Uh, most cases, it's going to take a year or more, and you've got to be compliant with the medication. You've got to take it, whatever it is, if it's two times a day, and you've got to, it's a topical agent, you've got to put it on the foot uh, or put it on the head. But it could, depending on how severe it is, it can take an awful long time to get rid of this. And because of that, a lot of patients, after six months, they're not getting any results. They tend to stop the medication, but you have to encourage you to keep on taking it, keep on taking it. So that's what the so-called ringworm um, or tinea uh, looks like. Like I said, it's like a ring that's happening over there. Um, but it is by no means is it any type of uh, parasitic worm. Okay. Uh, these are other areas that you can see it on the body. Some of them can get pretty severe, as you can see over here. Okay. Um, and you can see also on the toenails, or the nails themselves. Sometimes uh, it'll go away, but the remnant, because nails take a long time for them to leave your body, you'll see the remnants of it um, that are happening over there. Uh, this may be the foot of your grandmother or grandfather. I call them dinosaur feet, um, but that's what's happening with this. And they get really, the fungus that's on the nails make the nails very, very thick. Um, so thick that it's hard to cut it. Your podiatrist is the one that's going to have to go in and use uh, a chainsaw. Uh, no, but um, a sandblaster. No, uh, but something that's going to uh, uh, chomp down on the, the thickness of the nail. Over there. Okay. So other fungi that you should know about is histoplasma, uh, which is it's an infection that happens deep in the lung. We also have those so-called candida that we talked about before that cause the yeast infection uh, in the vagina or the oral thrush that happens in the mouth. Um, but think of this uh, is candida and aspergillus are um, normal flora of the skin and intestines, but think opportunistic infections. Think why are we, you know, here this is like her, uh, her fourth yeast infection in six months. Why is she having all these, even when she's having treatments? 
Is there something else going on? Is it that she's got diabetes where her immune system goes, goes down and this is actually uh, the candida uh, in the vagina is getting more and more prominent? Or does this person have HIV? Is there some other underlying issue going on? Because we treated this woman, but now she keeps on getting it four times in, or three times in four months. That's just too often if she really is taking the medication. All right? And also we have pneumocystis perenni, um, and that's the one that's going to cause serious pneumonia and AIDS. Now this is an interesting name for nomenclature over here. Me in medical school, um, we've known it as pneumocystis perenni. Recently, they've noticed that there's another bug that's in the same family that's also uh, happening uh, in patients with AIDS, and it's called pneumocystis geovecchi. Uh, a lot of times they use these two terms interchangeably because they're treated the same way. So either way, you should recognize both of those as being the pneumocystis perenni or pneumocystis, pneumocystis um, gerovecci uh, pneumonia that's happening in there. Sometimes we refer to this as PCP, pneumocystis perenni pneumonia, or PJP, which is pneumocystis gerovecci um, uh, pneumonia. Okay. So just, if you see either one of those, think AIDS, because that's usually uh, the only time you usually see this uh, fungus growing in someone is that they have AIDS, okay? Okay, uh, now know these fungal infections. Again, uh, the ones I talked about in the PowerPoint are important, and the only ones in the books that I want you to know are the ones that are on here. Now, when I say that again, it's the only ones that are found in Chapter 4 in the textbook, again, the one that's uh, the, the nature of disease, um, and only worry about what's in there. So if it's just a paragraph or two, that's all you really need to know for the next test. So I do want you to know about candida. We kind of killed that with the last chapter. The last chapter, yeah, the one with the immune system. Um, histoplasmosis, aspergillus, and lastly, as we mentioned, with HIV and AIDS, the pneumocystis, uh, Carini or uh, Giovecci. Okay, so those four you should know something about. All right, and the last one I want to talk about is parasites. Okay, so parasites are broken down into three different things protozoa, uh, which are one celled organisms, like the plasmodium that we talked about with malaria, the helminths. And these are the parasitic worms, the tapeworms and, and the flatworms. And then we have the ectoparasites, which are big things you can see with the naked eye. We're looking at the scabies and the lice that's involved with that. So the protozoa, again, they're one-celled organisms that are usually motile on here. They can move around. They're capable of producing, reproducing within the cells. So think of the plasmodium that goes into the red blood cells. They go through a larval change, a metamorphosis inside the red blood cell, and then burst the red blood cell, and now it's in the bloodstream where a mosquito can take that and pass it to the next person. Um, and the way you can see these is in the blood smears. Uh, you may see it in the stool, so they may need to do a stool sample or a biopsy of a part of the skin or wherever they got to go. Okay? So examples, the plasmodium, as we talked about, leads to uh, malaria. Trichomonas vaginalis, that causes a vaginitis that happens there. And the other big one that you should know about, um, I'm not going to spend too much time on it here, but read that paragraph or two that's in your textbook, is Giardia lamblita. Um, the, the one on here, this is probably, I think, Denver's or Carlotto's um, state bug. I think this is probably the big one over here. Um, this one causes diarrhea. If you see someone who has gone to... Uh, Denver to go hiking up there and they come back a week later or so and they have severe diarrhea that's watery um, ask them have you been drinking the water of the stream because we tend to see a lot of giardia in that uh, part of the country uh, that's contaminated in the uh, the streams over there so do make sure you do know uh, these three over here with some emphasis with the uh, giardia on there we also have the helmets, and these are parasitic worms. They infect about 33%, about a third of the worldwide. So this is a big thing you should be uh, recognizing, especially people who go to foreign countries 
and come back after vacation there. Uh, they may use both, uh, multiple species in their life cycle. Um, the schistosomiasis, uh, they happen to occur in snails, and that's part of their life cycle, and then they go into the humans. Um, this one we usually see, uh, I guess in Egypt I see this, um, there's snails in the Nile River over there, the other rivers that are going around there. Uh, they go swimming in there, uh, the people, and somehow the snails, uh, they attach to the feet of these people and eventually go into the, uh, the body of the people, and they have this. So this is actually uh, probably the number one uh, parasitic worm that is causing more morbidity and mortality throughout the whole world. Uh, so that one you should know also. Okay, uh, it infects the GI tract, the liver, blood, muscle. Okay, so that's what happens over here. This can cause us, uh, this bug over here can cause uh, cirrhosis of the liver, uh, which again, we'll talk about cirrhosis when we get to the GI tract and its disorders. Again, you'll have to look at blood smears or check the uh, stool samples or biopsies to see where this is. Then we have our so-called ectoparasites. These are small insect-like creatures. This is the section where it's going to deal with fleas, ticks, lice, and scabies. All right? They attach and live on the skin. Um, you, you've probably heard of lice. Lice is the one that usually attaches to the scalp. That's where you usually see most of the lice that's going on. Scabies we usually see, um, I'll tell you a short uh, uh, antidote about this one. Um, one of my patients. Scabies is these little black, they look like a little smaller than poppy seeds. And you'll see them crawling on, I had a woman that came on, I'll just go right into it. Um, I had a patient who was complaining of irritation of her vulva, which is the outside of the, of, of the general area. So I said, okay, let's take a look and see what's going on. So I examined her and I looked at the pubic hairs and lo and behold, I see these pretty scary. You see these little poppy seeds start moving around. I couldn't see the little legs, but they're moving around. And you got to be careful with these because they do jump. I had a, like, whoa, I saw it. I knew exactly what it was. Um, so I was a little concerned. Um, they could start biting at your skin, and that's what was causing irritation. Pretty easy to get rid of, but it's a pretty tedious thing because they have to use uh, special shampoo to kill everything. They have to take all their sheets they're closed, they have to uh, get a special uh, laundry detergent and under hot, hot water to make sure everything gets, clears out. So that's what happens. And she was concerned. She said, well, I need to work. I gotta go back to work. I said, well, what do you do? And because I don't see an issue, but uh, she says, I work at Wendy's. I'm like, oh. <laughs> uh, my next question was, uh, uh, which Wendy's? Um, <laughs> so, um, so she wanted to work, you know, definitely have to wash your hands and, you know, after you use the bathroom. Um, I, so it was hopefully she didn't go ahead and work or she actually uh, did a whole weekend and she cleared up or she did all the things I wrote the prescriptions for, for the shampoo and for the, um, uh, for the laundry detergent and whatnot. Um, but yeah, so you just have to be careful. Scabies uh, tends to be in uh, the, obviously the pubic hair um, and in the armpits. They usually like to go where there's... Um, the temperature is much higher, and it's moisture in those areas over there, in the groin area, in the armpits. Uh, there's more moisture there, and it's, it's hotter there. Um, and it may cause skin irritation, as I mentioned to you. Uh, they may carry other smaller pathogens, and Lyme disease gets in there that goes on to the ticks and whatnot. So we'll get into Lyme disease when we talk about um, bones, when we talk about um, arthritis. All right, so know these parasitic infections. Again, I'm just concerned about the ones that are in my PowerPoints, this one here, just this PowerPoint, and what's in the, um, in the, uh, the textbook, The Nature of Disease. Only worry about what's in that chapter, chapter four. Don't worry about expanding into other chapters or other books. You can do that on your own. That's fine, but I won't go further into asking questions and what's in that uh, chapter of the book. So the ones I want you to know is Plasmodium, of course, that's malaria. Uh, Trypanosoma giardia, I mentioned that over in Denver, okay? Uh, Trichomonas, that's the one that causes vaginitis. So these are the protests you should know. Then we have the, our parasitic worms, and I picked a round worm, flat worm, and tapeworm. Uh, so make sure you know these over here. 
And the ectoparasites, for now, the only ones I want you to know is lice and scabies. Okay? So that's pretty much what I want you to do. Now, the last thing I just want to mention to you is I don't want you to worry about the sexually transmitted diseases. I know I mentioned that earlier to you. Don't worry about them yet. Okay? I know there's about five, six, eight pages of it in this chapter four, but I'm going to save that when we do the reproductive system. Okay? So don't worry about syphilis. Don't worry about um, H HPV, except for what I already talked about before. Don't worry about H HIV, except what I talked about before. Don't worry about gonorrhea, chlamydia, or um, what's the other one? Um, Herpes. Herpes is the other one. Uh, so um, just worry about the, the ones that I mentioned over here, but the sexually transmitted diseases we'll take care of uh, when we get the reproductive. Okay? Chemotherapeutic agents, antibiotics, the thing is they interfere with the metabolism of the microbes. So think of a bacteria going through metabolism. I'm making a protein synthesis, making a protein. These antibiotics are going to interfere with that. The viruses are not going to be able to work well with these, right? Because they don't go through metabolism. They don't make protein. So the way viruses, uh, antibi um, the antiviral medication is there, they're going to stop that RNA going into the host cell. It's different, okay? So these, let's say, can't... Um, Antibiotics that we're going to talk about really quickly is they're going to act on different cellular targets as long as you understand how the bacteria work. Antibiotics come from living cells, okay? Um, they're made by some microbes. That's how basically penicillin in the 1950s was made. We noticed that this bacteria was able to fight off another bacteria. How? Because it was making this thing that we later called penicillin. So we said, well, geez, we're going to take that Thing out of that, and we could use it to fight off other bacteria on our cells. That's where that whole thing started. And that's where, you know, that's why we don't see many people dying from infections, get more heart disease, but infections, it's because of that. Okay? So that's antibiotics. Synthetic drugs are made solely in the laboratory. Okay? So what happens here, and I'm not going to ask you questions so much on this, but just the idea here's a bacterial cell. Here you have penicillins that will interfere with the cell wall. Here you have things like tetracycline, streptomycin, is going, to, is going to interfere with translation. That's why you need to know that stuff from AMP1. This is to emphasize when you get into pharmacology, you've got to go back to stuff in AMP1. You can't forget this stuff. They expect you to know what translation is. All right? Um, here you have things like quinolones and rifampin. It's going to inhibit transcription and also replication over here, and so forth. This here, if you remember, this is the ribosome. And here's where mRNA is. So we have certain medications that's going to, um, like tetracycline, is going to interfere in different parts of translation. And that's where it all comes in. All right, this is penicillin attacking that. Uh, penicillin attacking a, a bacteria. You can see it on there. So how do you choose which drug to use? Mode of action, right? Penicillin works on gram positive. You're not going to give it to a gram negative bacteria. My theory doesn't do anything with penicillin, right? Or penicillin doesn't do anything with gram negative bacteria. Worried about side effects. They don't want these side effects. Too much nausea and vomiting. They probably won't take the medication that's causing too much of that. So you've got to be careful with that. And sensitivity versus resistance, right? When you get a throat culture, you have two parts to it. The culture is going to get the bacteria that's back there, put it on a petri dish, and let it grow so we can see what's on there. It's gonna, we're going to culture it. If it comes back as nothing that's causing disease, then you don't have strep throat, so to say. But if it does have something on there, then we're going to 
do the next test, which is sensitivity. So we know what we know what bacteria is there, but what is that bacteria sensitive to in terms of antibiotics? So they do this Kirby Bauer antibiotic sensitivity test. And I think you guys, if you've done microbiology, you've done this where you're going to put this bacteria on here, and then you put these little discs. Each one has a different antibiotic on it. And then you see the sensitivity on here. Where this is very sensitive. This is your bacteria on here. And it killed all the bacteria here. And it's pretty wide. You measure all this. But this one didn't kill so much. So it's more sensitive to this and more resistant to this. And that's what that culture and sensitivity is all about. Okay?